Tonight, I want to speak to you about marriage. Now, you might think that's a strange topic. Some of you, I know, have been married for many years. Some have been widowed for a good number of years. Some perhaps have never been married. But marriage, including Christian marriage, is under attack from a secular agenda from the devil. Social attitudes are so pervasive that there is a danger that even Christians lose a clear biblical perspective on this topic. Marriage in our land is no longer defined by the biblical standard of being between one man and one woman. Recently, the government introduced a no-fault divorce, making divorce so easy that marriage has become almost a consumer product that you can change at whim. And I've heard it suggested that in America, divorce among Christians has reached levels similar to that of society in general. But other forms of social arrangement, both formal, such as civil partnerships, and informal, are now commonplace and are routinely represented in TV programmes and adverts. They are part of our unconscious acceptance of today's society. So let me set out my objectives from the start. My aim is to present a brief overview of biblical perspectives of marriage to remind us all of what it really represents. Hopefully, that will enable us to engage constructively with those around us on the real meaning of marriage. The Bible has much to say on marriage, so we will do uh, no more than scratch the surface in the time available to us this evening. You might therefore want to undertake further study yourself, uh, and you will be able to do so, hopefully, by uh, noting down the references that I will uh, uh, make during the sermon. We will look across the whole span of Scripture. The Bible is like a rope. It is made up of many themes that run throughout Scripture. As the strands twist and turn, sometimes a theme is on the surface, it's visible. At other times, it's deep in the structure, helping to provide strength in the overall picture. But we will look at the topic under three headings. True biblical standard, broken marriage, and restoration. So first, the true biblical standard. The passage that we read from Ephesians 5 is key to our understanding of marriage. Look at verses 29 to 32. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. This sets the keystone for our understanding of marriage. It is an illustration of Christ and the church. Marriage is not illustrated by Christ and the church. The relationship between Christ and the church is one that will last into eternity. And it thus extends beyond the concept of marriage as we know it. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 22. Jesus was given a hypothetical trick question about marriage between one woman and successively seven brothers. But Jesus states quite categorically, at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. I have even heard Christians talk about being married forever. No, that is contrary to scripture. Marriage is for this life only. So marriage can only, at best, be an illustration of that greater relationship that lasts forever between Christ 
and his church. Genesis 2 forms a foundation for our thoughts on, on marriage. Verse 18 says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. In his compassion, God was concerned about the isolation of Adam. At this stage, he was unique in creation. Made in the image of God, he was unlike the animals. Among the animals, Adam was unable to find a suitable helper, someone of his own kind, of his own nature, a true companion to be with him, who would help him to fill the earth and rule over it in fulfilment of God's command. The creation of Eve from Adam's rib is highly significant. Eve was created from Adam, created in the image of God, we are told, but female, to be a helper for Adam. They were equal, but with different roles, complementary. They were physically different, but both were made in the image of God. Together, they would rule over God's creation. They were to become one with each other. They would spend, they could spend more, we could spend more time here, but we need to look further into scripture to get the broader picture. So 1 Corinthians 7 has something to say about this oneness. Verses three and four. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Just after a lockdown, when regulations were being relaxed a little bit, it was decided by the people where we lived that it was time for a distanced street picnic. People would have their own picnic on their front lawn, but people would be free to wander up and down the street talking to their neighbours, uh, provided that they maintained the regulation two metres distance. One lady in a house opposite us was complaining loudly to neighbours about the fact her husband had grown a beard and she didn't like it. But these verses say that he can't do that independently. Now that's a trivial example, but the point is clear. In giving ourselves over to someone in marriage, we give up an exclusive right over even our own bodies. As Christians, we belong to Christ. We are not free to just please ourselves. The issue has deep implications for our society, including in the abortion debate. The idea that this is my body, I can do what I want with it, simply is not true. And we'll return to this topic later. But I just want to say something about singleness. In this passage, Paul is going to go on and imply that it is better to remain single. But he calls this a gift from God. And it is a gift that is given so such a person can better serve the Lord. We think, for example, of Jeremiah, who was commanded to remain single. However, no sacrifice for the Lord ever goes without being rewarded. In one sense, this sacrifice enables the individual to draw nearer to God because they are less encumbered with aspects of life in this world. But that is not to say that there are not great blessings in marriage. There are. But there are also great blessings in singleness lived for the glory of God. Before we move on to the next aspect, I want to draw attention to the role and status of the wife. For many years, the cultural picture of the wife in this country was our indoors, but rather, so rather derogatory. And in many countries, even in this country, 
such images remain. Paul gives instructions in Titus 2 of the vital work that women can do for the Lord. But perhaps the archetypal wife is found in Proverbs 31. She is a clever, hard-working businesswoman who manages her home and her family well. Her diligence frees up her husband for a position of responsibility as a town elder. He is respected partly because of her. I honour God and Heather by saying that God has blessed me with such a wife. As an elder of the church at Hyde Heath, I have been able to take on wider responsibilities because I have the help and support of a faithful Christian wife. In the context of being the bride of Christ in Revelation 21, Christians should note this model. Christ, our spiritual husband, is honoured when we are faithful and diligent in serving him, in serving our marriage partner. Is that true for us? Second, marriage broken. In Genesis 3, we have the story of the fall. This not only disrupts the relationship between God and man, it also disrupts the relationship between man and woman, between husband and wife. This break in relationships affects the rest of scripture. The conflict this breakdown brings destroys the oneness of marriage. It leads to cruelty, infidelity and enmity. Several years ago, Heather and I attended a wedding of two Christians. It was quite a shocking occasion to me. The husband cried all the way through his speech. The wife, in her speech, specifically highlighted that she had not promised to obey her husband. The chief bridesmaid, in her speech, concluded it by giving a toast to equality. But of course, she didn't mean equality. She really meant something more in the form of independence and conflict. The marriage has not gone well and has concluded a number of years of separation. But throughout the Old Testament, this breakdown between God and his people, particularly the Jews, is typified by terms such as prostitution and adultery. The oneness of God's, pe God's people with God has been broken. We can think of such incidents as the golden calf that Aaron made at Mount Sinai. And even in that incident, there is similar deflection and lies in Aaron's excuses, as we see from those of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. The break in relationships is condemned in some very difficult passages to read, such as Ezekiel 16 and 23. The sadness and bitterness of such passages as Israel abandoned God in favour of foreign alliances and pagan gods, these passages should be a rebuke to us so that we, are always, that we always desire to be faithful to God. God has included these things to sharpen our recognition of the offence to his holiness and purity that comes from the unfaithfulness of his people. Romans 1, Paul, in Romans 1, Paul makes it clear that the break in relationships between God and man led to paganism. And consequently, God abandoned mankind to de develop their own lusts, which led to homosexuality. Although this is set out in Romans, the impact of it is felt as early as Genesis 19 but reappears a number of times in the Old Testament in highly destructive ways. We can think of Lot in the final, and the final chapters of the book of Judges as examples where destructive influences of homosexuality are given freedom. 
whilst the most serious break caused by sin was between God and man. The fracture between, of relationships between men and women are also obvious in scripture. Polygamy was established early on. And this leads to uh, create, this creates tensions between wives, but also between their, the wives and their husbands. And we can think of Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. David, too, fell into sin because of his multiple wives and relaxed attitudes to marriage. It also created tensions between his children and, in one instance, led to civil war. Solomon similarly fell into this trap with the result that he was led away from God by worshipping the gods of his wives. And this, in turn, led to the breakup of the nations of the nation. Western societies have legislated against polygamy for many years. Nevertheless, in our permissive society, such things are coming back into vogue, at present largely informally. Culturally, permissiveness is no longer frowned upon, nor even engaging sexually with multiple partners at the same time. Polygamy is legitimate in many Muslim countries and consequently many other countries permit such arrangements where the people entered into the marriages before arriving in the other country. This is not an issue that is going to go away. Christians should be a bastion against the relaxation of moral standards in our world. Prostitution is mentioned in Genesis. This was to become a cultic feature of pagan religions into which God's people would be drawn with devastating results. For example, just prior to the entry into Canaan, where the Israelites were enticed to worship the Baal of Peor in Numbers 23. And thirdly, restoration. We have seen that the ultimately the truth, the true meaning of marriage is restored when the church becomes the bride of Christ. But we have seen uh, just how departure from God's given standard corrupts society. Whilst we might lament the state of our nation, of our church even, it could be worse. Why is it not worse? Because God has acted to redeem and restore things, not just in eternity through the death and resurrection of his son who paid the penalty for our sin. No, the Bible has a number of examples guiding God's people to live for him, to act in a Christ-like way, restoring relationships. In 2 Corinthians 6, Paul warns against close relationships close bonds between God's people and a world ruled by Satan. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or, <coughs> or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and the idols? For we are the temple of the living God. This issue comes up in Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah is a sad example of a faithful, uh, of a faithful man, a great man who struggled against a secular society that failed to learn from the lessons of the past. At the end of his story, he is fighting against a nation that has fallen back into intermarriage with pagans, such that their children cannot even speak the native language of their own land. And consequently, of course, they would not be able to read God's word or hear its instruction. But praise God for such men as Nehemiah, who in difficult circumstances God raised up to stand for truth and righteousness, 
to lead the nation according to God's commands. How we need such men in our day. In that sense, we might therefore see Nehemiah as a type of Christ, the one who came and fulfilled the law. And of course, the picture of Christ is much richer as he is the one who, through his death and resurrection, set his people free from the power of sin. Christ is a picture for us in scripture of the kinsman redeemer who rescues his people and restores their lives. A classic example, of course, is of Boaz in the book of Ruth, a godly man of graciousness and kindness who marries the penniless foreign widow, bringing her honour and standing in his community, and ultimately a place in the great rescue story as an ancestor of the Lord Jesus. A much grittier example of this sort of redemption comes in the story of Hosea. Here the prophet is instructed to marry a prostitute as an illustration of the relationship between God and his faithful, faithless people that we referred to in Ezekiel. In chapter 3, Hosea even has to go and buy back his wife as an illustration of the way that God would redeem his people from the Babylonian exile and, of course, that greater redemption of all his people through the cross. I don't know about you, but there are parts of the Bible that seem hard. I've heard pastors refer to the book of Leviticus as one which they're reluctant to get to grips with in preaching. Others want to avoid revelation. But to me, one of the most difficult is the Song of Solomon. Modern translations attempt to make it clearer by setting out the way that they uh, suggest different people are speaking the different passages. Nevertheless, it remains a controversial book. There are those who say that it is about the love between a man and a woman. Others see it, quite rightly, as being about Christ, because Christ is the object of all the scriptures. Others see it as a combination of these positions. One book that I've been reading recently is adamant that it is only about Christ and the church and that to see anything different is a gross sin. Some of his conclusions, though, seem somewhat bizarre to me. In the Song of Solomon is about the relationship between Christ and the church. The very fact that the book is written in terms of courtship and marriage must surely make the book relevant to that situation too. And if the Song of Solomon is about Christ and the church, then automatically that provides guidance as to how relationships between Christians should be conducted because Christ is our example. Of course, the language used in Song of Solomon is at times alien to a modern culture and would not well serve a modern courting couple. And it is clear that the book is based on the post-fall world where there are struggles in the relationship both before and after the marriage. But, all scripture, but like all scripture, the Song of Solomon is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Certainly one clear lesson is the desire for close union which should be prominent in the church and in marriage. Christ, the lover and husband, is the most desirable. We should not take lightly our union with him as his people. We've covered a lot of ground, but I want us to end by looking back at Ephesians 2. Jesus taught his disciples in Mark 9.35 that leadership involves being a servant of others. As Ephesians 5.21 points out, we need to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But Paul immediately goes on to point out that there is also a structure in the church, in marriage, the need to submit to leadership, 
does not overturn the need for humility and the recognition that we serve one who is higher. And we need to remember that even Christ submitted himself to his Father's will. Arranged marriages are largely gone from British culture, although influences of other national cultures may be re-establishing them here again. Consequently, love for was, many, for was for many years a key feature of marriage. The nature of that love is set out here in verses 25 to 28. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present him, her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. If husband and wife are truly one together, as we noted earlier, then a man or a woman cannot hate their marriage partner without hating themselves. The model for that love here is the example of Christ who sacrificed himself on the cross to redeem us. The husband is therefore to live sacrificially to promote the good of his wife so that she is honoured and esteemed in the same way that Christ Jesus lives to promote our spiritual good by teaching, training, rebuking and correcting us through his word, through the circumstances of our daily lives. He is moulding us to be fit for the presence of his father. One of the many jokes about marriage partners is this. Behind every successful woman, uh, behind every successful man, there is a woman with nothing to wear. The idea being that she must have a new dress for each occasion. But spiritually speaking, we should rather say that behind every successful Christian husband, there is a wife of radiant beauty, a wife whose life glorifies God, a woman clothed in righteousness whose, whose husband seeks to promote her welfare physically and spiritually. Husbands, you are responsible for your, how your wife is spiritually dressed. There is much more that could be said. There are aspects that we have not touched on at all. But finally, let us reflect on the godly wisdom of the traditional marriage vows. I take thee to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, cherish and to obey, till death us do part according to God's holy ordinance, and therefore to I give you my troth, or make you my promise. As the bride of Christ, should we as Christians not make similar promises? The main difference, of course, would be that death will actually bring us closer to Christ. These vows highlight that problems will come, but that we should remain steadfast in our commitment to our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. If Christians were thus committed to Christ, they would find that the bond with their husband or wife would be much stronger too. May God enable us to live for him in this way, that we might bring him honour and glory.